Morning everyone, um, hope you're all uh, safe and well out there and welcome to our, um, our, our webinar on how to run a uh, lawful procurement competition. Just to flag up, we've got another uh, webinar on the 1st of July, which you may have seen on the flyer, but that's about challenging and, uh, and defending procurement decisions. So uh, log into that one if you haven't uh, booked for that already. Just by way of intros, I'm Rob Walton QC, I'll be chairing today. Uh, I'll be doing a, a presentation uh, at the start and then you'll also hear from James, Neil and Galena Ward, two of our procurement specialists, and I'll introduce them uh, just ahead of their, their talks as well. We're going to run for an hour, so we'll, we'll stop uh, at 12 o'clock, uh, come what may. We, do, uh, we are aiming to have a, a question and answer session at the end. Um, there is a, a chat panel uh, which is available to you all, uh, so if you do have questions, uh, type them into there. Uh, and we'll do what we can uh, at the end to, to answer some of those, uh, but that will be time dependent. So uh, without any uh, further ado, uh, I'm now going to present uh, to you uh, an overview uh, of the uh, public procurement rules. And this will, for, we've got a range of people out there, I, I know, so for some of you this will be uh, an introduction, some of you it'll be a refresher, uh, and for some of you it will be old hat, uh, but uh, uh, here we go. So what is public procurement law? It is the, the law governing the award of public contracts and concessions by public bodies to third parties. It's EU based, we've got a series of directives, we've got the public contracts directives, the concessions directive, uh, the utilities contract directive, and the defence and security procurement directive. And they of course are brought into force into UK law by regulations and we've got regulations there corresponding to the respective uh, directives. Uh, I'll be focusing most of all on the, uh, the, the PCRs, the Public Contract Regulations 2015. Uh, we'll dip into some of the others as well as, as we go through, but my main focus will be the PCRs. Should also flag up, there are uh, other things out there too. Uh, we've got other forms of public auctions and, and franchising, uh, radio spectrum au auctioning, um, uh, energy subsidies, uh, rail franchise uh, and, uh, and competitions for things like the National Lottery. In relation to rail franchise, uh, those of you who've got a, a couple of moments to spare, might dip into the very recent stagecoach decision uh, that's come out of the High Court, uh, 193 pages, uh, 601 paragraphs uh, thereof, but uh, um, that is a very recent decision on rail franchising. In terms of the scope of the rules, uh, dealing uh, with PCRs, and we'll come back to a bit of this, um, a public contract uh, is a contract uh, for the execution of works, the supply of products, uh, provision of services, uh, and they apply to all contracting authorities uh, and a phrase that's important there is bodies governed by public law and we'll just come back to that in a second. There are detailed contract thresholds uh, but uh, do uh, note of course that even if you're above, uh, sorry even if you're, if you're below the thresholds, uh, the general um, uh, functioning of the EU principles, uh, the basic fairness principles, non-discrimination etc, transparency can still apply to sub-threshold contracts. In terms of utilities, um, we are uh, talking about uh, uh, bodies, contracting authorities, public undertakings, entities which carry out a, a relevant activity by virtue of being granted special and exclusive rights to do so. Uh, but just to flag up uh, where uh, it's been granted those rights under a compliant process run under the regs, uh, it is not called. In terms of relevant activities, we're talking about energy, waste, transport, fuel extraction, etc. That's all set out in regs. 9 to 15 of the utilities regs and again we've got uh, detailed uh, thresholds uh, and we've got exemptions applying to amongst other things in-house contracts and I'll come back to, to that particular point uh, in, in uh, one of my final slides. And in terms of concessions uh, that's a contract for pecuniary interest uh, between a contracting authority and an economic operator uh, where uh, one of two things applies where the contract gives the right to exploit the works or the services or, or where the contractor has the right together with some form of payment from the contracting authority or the utility. So who's called? I said we'd come back to this. Uh, contracting authority, uh, top left, you can see uh, from Reg 2 of the, the regulations, uh, means the state, regional, or local authorities, uh, bodies governed by public law, uh, etc. And then if you come over to the right hand side of the slide, again from Reg 2, uh, that phrase bodies governed by public law means bodies that have all of the following characteristics. A, they're established for a, a specified purpose of meeting needs in the general interest, not having an industrial or commercial character. Uh, and I'll come back to that point 
in a second. B is that they have legal personality. And then under C, they have any of the following characteristics, one, two, or three, financed for the most part by the state, subject to management supervision uh, by the state, etc. Uh, or they have an, uh, an, an admin or managerial supervisory board, more than half of whose members are appointed by the state. And then if you come uh, bottom left, what is uh, commercial character? There we've got reference to the Alstom decision back in 2012. Uh, and there the court was applying the uh, Cohonan uh, ECJ case of 2003 uh, and, and looking at what was meant by commercial character. And it's, it's put in a sort of slightly negative way. Um, but if the body operates in normal market conditions, aims to make a profit, bears the losses associated with the exercise of its activity, it's unlikely that the needs it aims to meet are not of an industrial or commercial nature. And then I just include also there a reference to uh, the relevance of the existence of competition or state aid, uh, and that was considered for the first time uh, in the, the Alstom case, not a determinative factor, even uh, if the body in question can't function without a, a sizable lump of state aid. Then what kind of contracts uh, are caught, uh, and here are the relevant thresholds, uh, dealing with public contracts, utility contracts, and uh, concession contracts. Uh, these come uh, from the uh, European uh, Commission. Uh, they've been uh, increased on the back of uh, two years of uh, exchange rate uh, variation. But uh, so far as you can see the slide, if you look in the, the central column uh, of the, uh, the public contracts um, thresholds under works contracts, the figure of uh, uh, 4 million uh, 700 or thousand, that figure you can see actually if you look across into the other tables too, is the headline figures in terms of uh, works contracts uh, across the board. Then in terms of exclusions and specific situations, uh, they are complex, uh, the rules on exclusions uh, and specific situations. In terms of exclusions, we're looking at uh, Reg 7 to 12 uh, of the PCRs. We're talking about utilities, electronic communications, international rules, uh, service contracts, and contracts between public sector entities. Specific situations are set out in regs, in the following regs, 13 through 17, for example, uh, mixed procurement involving defence. Just to flag up one point there actually, in relation to um, uh, exemptions, if you look at uh, Reg 32 uh, of, the, of the regs, there you have got um, uh, rules on when uh, the uh, procedures uh, don't have to be followed. Uh, and just given the, the current context, uh, we've got there um, where uh, an exemption is, 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 um, is, is granted, where insofar as it is strictly necessary, where for reasons of extreme urgency brought about by events unforeseeable by the contracting authority, the time limits for the uh, procedures can't be complied with. So the, the classic example obviously is what we're all currently living through, unforeseen events uh, making the, the process too unwieldy to get things done which need to be done. Then in terms of the, the scope of the rules, uh, just to flag up uh, three areas uh, which are, are problematic. Uh, we've got aggregation rules in Regulation 6, uh, obviously uh, designed to prevent, uh, prevent the bypassing uh, of the rules through uh, successive awards or, or uh, artificial uh, subdivision, the salami slicing approach. Then we've got uh, in-house public contracts, that's um, uh, Regulation 12, uh, and that's following um, uh, an ECJ decision uh, back in 1999, uh, more recently uh, considered in uh, an Italian case uh, dealing with the award of a waste contract. Uh, that was the, an ECJ decision in 2016. And then in terms of what a concession is, um, this is uh, obviously in the concession regs. Uh, the key features are set out in Regulation 3 uh, and the uh, phrase I've underlined there is the operating and marketing risk. That's a, a complex area uh, in its own right. Uh, just by way of example, um, this is a, a relatively recent case, uh, 2019. This is where um, Ocean uh, uh, were outbid uh, on a, um, a for, for a lease of two um, advertising towers on the Hammersmith flyover, and they sought to argue that the um, the process uh, should have been uh, subject to the uh, procurement uh, principles. Uh, but uh, what the court has held there is that the services to be entrusted. Uh, must be for the benefit of the contracting authority, so here uh, the London Borough of Hammersmith, uh, in respect of its public obligations uh, and, and, and they have to be in the public interest. So uh, the mere commercial exploitation of the assets absent a public service element, so renting out your land to put up advertising hoardings, uh, won't be caught. 
uh, just to flag up the very first line of that judgment uh, where the judge uh, said uh, quite rightly that the rules governing public procurement uh, grow ever more complex. In terms of the primary principles, uh, they're set out in Regulation 18 and uh, in a nutshell it's fairness, uh, so contracting authorities uh, shall treat economic op operators equally uh, without discrimination and shall act in a transparent and proportionate manner. You can't artificially narrow down um, competition through the design of the procurement uh, and you can see in three uh, that for the purpose of two, competition shall be considered to be artificially narrowed where the design of the procurement is made with the intention of unduly favouring or disadvantaging certain economic operators. And then we have similar principles uh, in both the utilities uh, and the concessions regs. And then finally, what are the main uh, procedures? Uh, and just simply flagging them up by way of headlines. Uh, for all public contracts, we have the, the open procedure. Uh, typically, if you're looking at the, the sale of uh, supply of goods and, and the issue is going to be cost, uh, then that's an open procedure and uh, that will be the defining uh, issue. Uh, the restricted procedure allows you to uh, front load the process by applying uh, criteria as to those who are entitled to bid. Uh, and the um, competitive uh, dialogue procedure, negotiated procedure and innovative partnership are all themselves subject to limitations. There's much greater procedural flexibility in terms of concession contracts and you can see there uh, in, in italics the contracting authority or utility shall have the freedom to organise the procedure leading to the choice of concessionaire subject to compliance with the regs. The basic requirement is to advertise via a concession notice uh, and transparent application of an objective award criteria. So look, that's it from me. Um, and so what I'll do now, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to James. Uh, and James will be known to uh, uh, many, if not all of you. Uh, he's the head of our public procurement group. Uh, he's got uh, very considerable expertise uh, in, in this area, of course, uh, career highlights. Uh, uh, we talk about Leighton Orient uh, taking on uh, um, uh, the uh, London Legacy uh, bunch with the, the, on the, in terms of the award for the, um, the Olympic Stadium. We've got uh, James is advising on uh, NHS procurement across the board, Crossrail 1, Thames Tideway, uh, you name it, he's been there. So to spare his blushes uh, further, I will hand over to James. Thank, uh, thanks, Rob. So um, I'm going to cover uh, five key areas when discussing how to run a lawful um, procurement competition. Uh, the, I've set them out on the slide here, and they broadly follow the chronological passage of a procurement competition. So I'm going to start by looking briefly at how to advertise the contract correctly, the, the fundamental requirement um, of a call for competition. I'll then look at uh, eligibility and the grounds upon which a contra contracting authority can exclude a bidder. And then um, moving into the, um, the meat of procurement exercise, we'll have a look at how to set both selection and evaluate, evaluative criteria uh, in, the, in the invitation to tender uh, lawfully and correctly. Um, moving through that, I'll be looking at the evaluation process and how to manage some of the legal risks there. Uh, Galeen is going to touch on a couple of uh, cases, go into a bit more detail there about uh, which, which highlight where some of the pitfalls are in um, evaluation. And then finally at the end, I'll look at how a contracting authority can lawfully um, award a contract and then lawfully enter into it um, following the expiry of the standstill. So um, advertising the, the contract correctly. Now this is the um, absolutely key requirement of any procurement exercise. Obviously you've got to, any um, public contract has to be um, advertised subject to the uh, exclusions that uh, Rob referred to in, in his presentation. Now, even before you get to um, advertising the contract um, uh, through a contract notice or a prior information notice, contracting authorities can, of course, engage with the market. Um, preliminary market consultation is now expressly permissible under Regulation 40 and 41 of the regs. Um, however, a attach a pretty major health warning to, um, to that, because whilst uh, Regulation 40 says that contracting authorities can 
carry out these sorts of consultations with a view to preparing the procurement and informing economic operators of their uh, plans and requirements. Um, they can only do so um, if using that advice uh, doesn't have the effect of distorting competition uh, and doesn't result in a violation of the principles of non-discrimination and transparency. So you can see there that any attempt to, to engage with market participants who may then go on to become bidders for the contracts um, is quite a high risk thing to do um, because you'll have to make sure that any information received uh, from a bidder uh, isn't used in a way that would constitute unequal treatments and would unfav uh, unfairly favour that bidder in the ensuing uh, procurement competition. So, um, contract authorities done market consultation, got that out of the way if it chooses to do so, then um, how does it advertise a contract um, or how does it issue the call for competition as it's named, as it's described in Regulation 26? Two, um, two ways of doing that. The, the first way and the most usual way is via a contract notice um, and that set out, the requirements of that are set out in Regulation 49. Um, you may often hear referred to OG notices, they're exactly the same thing. The reason they're called OG notices is that contract notices um, have to be issued in the official journal of the European Union. There are um, specified um, things that, or, or matters that have to be included in a contract notice, and I'm not going to uh, go through all of those, but they're set out in part C to Annex 5 of the actual directive. And for obvious reasons, you, they, they include things like the description of the procurement, what it is that's being procured, uh, the nature and extent of works, et cetera, et cetera. But pretty important to make sure, um, contract, contract authorities have to make sure that they go through and, and uh, tick the right boxes on the um, aging notices to make sure they can avoid any suggestion that they haven't issued a, a valid uh, AG notice. Now, under the 2015 PCRs, a new um, type of notice came in called the Prior Information Notice. Effectively, that's an alternative. In certain instances, that can be used as an alternative to a contract notice. Um, I'm not going to go through um, all, all those particular circumstances, but they're available uh, the use of PINs is available to sub-central contract authorities, say for example local authorities, um, if they're using um, the restricted or competitive dialogue um, procedures. And effectively what, they, what, what it achieves is it allows, if you issue one of these notices, it allows the, time, the mandatory time frames set out within those procedures to be truncated. So it can save time um, if, if a local authority wants to uh, conduct a procurement um, more swiftly than would otherwise be required under the PCRs. Now, um, why is it critical to get right this, this uh, obligation to issue a call for competition? Well, the reason it's critical is because um, a failure to advertise a contract correctly will lead to a risk of declaration of ineffectiveness as a remedy um, if should an agree bidder want to bring a challenge. Or, or, or not even agree bid at any other economic operator that didn't uh, receive that opportunity. So um, that's why it's so important. Now, if for whatever reason a contracting authority does not advertise a contract and um, just for whatever reason, either through inadvertence or because it thought the regs didn't apply, hasn't done so, but they want to reduce the risk of uh, a declaration of ineffectiveness. There is um, something called the voluntary transparency notice procedure um, available. Um, now, those used to be called VEAT notices, voluntary ex ante transparency notices under the old regs. Key point here is that they don't um, constitute a panacea and um, they cannot fix a, a, procure, a, a procurement of a contract that hasn't been advertised um, if, the, uh, if the authority has just simply made a, uh, a mistake and, and realises it's made a mistake and just wants to cover its tracks. It can only be used where an authority genuinely thinks that it didn't need to comply, uh, to comply with the public contract regulations. 
um, and just wants to eliminate the risk of a declaration of ineffectiveness. And the Court of Justice has made it clear in, um, in Fastware that when looking at whether it issued, whether an authority issued a, a BTN um, in, uh, correctly, will look at whether the authority acted diligently in deciding that it didn't need to uh, carry out a procurement text of advertiser contract. And we'll also look at effectively whether the authority has acted in um, has, has acted in good faith and has and has genuine reasons why um, it thought the PCRs didn't apply. So it's not a get out of jail card free, uh, free get out of jail free card um, by any stretch of imagination. And a good example of that was the um, Faraday case, which concerned a challenge to a development agreement, where the court there said that the BTN. Um, issued by the authority in that case wasn't valid for various reasons um, but it, 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 it highlights that particular case highlights the limitations of the use of these notices now you might be thinking it, what, what why is this such a big deal surely it's pretty easy just to advertise a uh, a contract and, and follow the, the regulations at the outset the real issue with advertising contracts arises where an authority decides that it wants to either extend or, or vary a contract already advertised. So the procurement could have happened years ago on a long-standing contract and it's a, an authority for whatever reason needs to modify that contract. Now that the, the situations in which you have to advertise a modification to a contract uh, is now codified in regulation 72 of the PCRs and I've, um, it's a fairly long um, regulation there's lots of um, exceptions but I put the I've summarized the main exceptions up on this screen. Um, the, the key point to note here is that the, the regulations really reflect what was broadly what was decided by the European Court of Justice and Presetex, namely that you can rely on most of these exceptions, but, off, but you have to also be satisfied that, or, or meet the test, that the change does not alter the overall nature of the contract. So you can see that even in, you can see that in the first bullet point, one of the exceptions where changes have, have been anticipated in the, the original um, procurement documents, the ITTs and the, the contract that was originally advertised. But nonetheless, if the modification alters the overall nature of the contract, you, you, you cannot rely on that exception. And the, a, similar, um, a similar qualification appears, you can see at the bottom of, of this slide, one of the exceptions is where a change is not substantial. Now, what does that mean? Well, Regulation 72 defines that as where um, the modification does not make the contract materially differ different or change the economic balance in favour of the contractor. Now, that, that directly reflects the, the press and text test. Um, and you can see it's, uh, it imports um, quite a high degree of uncertainty because it doesn't set out any, in any further detail how can you decide whether a modification is materially different or not. You have to go through this exercise of um, assessing the, the nature of the contract and in, and in particular when looking at the economic balance, seeing whether or not the changes you've made would have invited or hypothetically would have allowed in another bidder had they been um, made aware of that at the outset when the original contract was advertised. There are various um, so-called safe harbour thresholds, I think up to about 10 or 15 percent of the value of the contract. But again, that rather woolly test of so long as the overall nature of the contract has not changed um, or, uh, appears there. Um, and again, in the context of, um, for example, uh, COVID-19, then unforeseen circumstances can be used to, um, to modify a contract, but that's again, there's a 50 percent a value threshold that applies in those cases. So um, moving on to the, um, the next slide, um, if we can just jump to the next slide because my button stopped working. So um, having advertised the contract, we're, we're now looking at um, the grounds upon which the contracting authority can um, exclude a bidder from a procurement process and this can um, this is obviously quite a fraught area because um, it's fairly drastic if you decide to exclude a bidder from a, 
a procurement exercise that it wants to take part in. The regulation, the key regulation is Regulation 57, that sets out mandatory grounds for exclusion. And as you can imagine, that includes um, where a contracting authority is being convicted of various criminal offences to do with fraud, money laundering, proceeds of crime, etc. And it also includes a situation where a person is a board member or has powers of representation, uh, um, decision making or control of the economic operator. Then there are discretionary grounds, which include um, uh, bankruptcy, but also importantly, uh, si significant or persistent deficiencies in the uh, performance of uh, a prior public contract. Now, that's quite an important uh, one to note because um, that did not feature in the um, earlier regulations and um, it's an important, it, it's a point that a lot of con contracting authorities understandably um, uh, want to, often want to rely on when um, looking at whether they should allow another a, a bidder into a process. Now, um, although Regulation 57 states that there are mandatory grounds for exclusion, they're not actually mandatory because um, self-cleaning um, is possible under Regulation 57, um, and I've set out subsection 13 to 17 there. And that's effectively where a, a contract authority is, is allowed to, in fact, entitled to demonstrate that notwithstanding its um, whatever uh, grounds for exclusion it may have uh, fallen within, it's, it, it nonetheless is reliable and can perform the contract. Um, I won't go into all the, um, all the, the process of that, but that's an important, it's an important uh, qualification to the um, grounds for exclusion. Um, and uh, one of the one of the instances, for example, if the economic operator has, has paid compensation for any damage caused by a criminal offence um, and whether it's it fully uh, cooperated with investigating um, authorities, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, moving on to um, the, move on to the next slide. Uh, setting lawful uh, selection and evaluation criteria. So we're now into the design of the ITT. How do you, um, how, how can, what criteria can you lawfully include in an ITT? The key point here is there is a fundamental distinction between selection criteria and evaluation criteria. And this distinction was discussed in, by the European Court of Justice in the ANACUS. Selection criteria um, are criteria that relate to the characteristics of the tenderer. So they're used to assess the tenderer's ability to perform the contract, including um, financial standing, etc. Um, they can only be deployed at the qualification stage. So only in, re in the restricted procedure and competitive dialogue uh, procedure um, can those come in. They can't be used in the open procedure. Now, um, Regulation 58 defines what selection criteria are or may relate to. Um, and again, various tests are imposed or requirements are imposed, but broadly they have to be related and proportionate to the subject matter of the contract. Um, there are fairly complex rules on um, means of proof of economic and financial standing, and those are all set out in Regulation 60, um, which which effectively form a little bit of a straitjacket on how contracting authorities can demand um, certain uh, certificates of standing from banks, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite, 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 um, there's not that much flexibility under that regulation. Um, award criteria are criteria that relate to the tender itself. And the um, contracting authorities have to apply the most economically advantageous test uh, when. Um, looking at how, when, when um, looking at to whom uh, they should award the contract based on um, those award criteria. The key point here is you can't bring in selection criteria back into the process when, and, and back in as an award criteria. So if a, if a tenderer has, has passed the qualification stage of a restricted process, then when you're into the, the um, evaluative stage of the bid itself, should only be applying uh, criteria that relate to the tender itself. Now, one of the areas that, that causes a lot of problems and, and has given rise to a lot of litigation is the extent to which 
criterion weightings have to be disclosed in advance in the ITT. The, the bottom line is that main criterion weightings have to be disclosed, sub-criteria ought to be disclosed, but not necessarily the weightings for those sub-criteria. And, 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 and that was set out in the case put up on the screen, um, ATI um, and confirmed in Varney. Uh, the, the bottom line of all of this is that it is better, it's obviously better to include, if you are applying sub-criteria, include weighting, just to avoid any arguments about uh, whether or not you've uh, met the ATI test, which you can see there are quite, um, again, quite woolly, um, whether those uh, sub-criteria and weightings alter the criteria for more of the contract, um, whether they could have affected the had they been known at the time whether they could affect the preparation of tenders. So to avoid all that, the most sensible thing to do is to include weightings for sub-criteria as well and avoid any argument. So um, moving on to um, the next slide, um, setting evaluation criteria um, and, the, um, and what's the test that applies. Well, the key point here, and I think this might be mentioned by Galena when she looks at some of the cases on this, the, the key um, point here is that award criteria have to be clear, precise, and unequivocal, so that a reasonably well-informed and diligent tenderer can understand their significance and interpret them the same way. That's the, uh, and that, that question, whether they are, whether the evaluation criteria satisfy the rewind test, um, surfaces time and time again in, in, in litigation and procurement challenges. It's probably the main area where um, challenge upon which challenges uh, are brought. So um, moving on to the um, next slide, how to deal with um, incumbent operator advantage. So one of the one of the questions that arises when looking at bid design and setting of criteria is how can a contracting authority lawfully uh, neutralize an incumbent operator's advantage and not give them an inherent advantage when bidding for um, a renewal of the same uh, contract or a similar contract. Um, essentially, the bottom line is that you can apply differential treatment to neutralize that advantage that an incumbent operator inherently has. Um, but ultimately, fundamentally, it has to be based on objective reasons. And it cannot, and it, and it, the test set out in the um, European Court of Justice in the uh, case I put up there on the first bullet point that um, as long as it doesn't amount to unequal tr treatment and where it's technically feasible, economic feasible, and does not infringe the rights of the existing provider, that doesn't really help that much. But the bottom line is where they're object, where it's objectively justified to neutralize incumbent operation advantage, that's um, acceptable. And clearly, given one of the purposes of public procurement is to promote competition, um, an objective reason could certainly be where it would encourage healthy and effective uh, competition. And that, that was confirmed in a plexor where um, the new tenders were allowed a 3% funding allowance to take over a contract. The incumbent operator was only given 0.3% perfectly reasonably because they wouldn't have incur those takeover costs. And that differential treatment was perfectly acceptable. And another recent case, uh, the proof by T case, where a criteria was included, um, which stated that, uh, which asked bidders whether they understood the objective of the framework contract. And, clear, and the argument was, well, the incumbent operator um, had an inherent advantage there because um, they, um, they, they'd already operated that contract. And the, and the European Court of Justice said, no, that's perfectly lawful because it, it's perfectly, objectively, uh, it, it, on an objective basis, it's perfectly reasonable to um, have that as included as a criteria. So, so that, that, that was a very quick canter through um, the uh, bid design and some of the, the key um, points that need to be thought about by a contracting authority when um, designing its bid. Just moving to um, the, the next slide, um, the evaluation process itself and how that should be managed. Um, so I've set up on this slide some of the, some of the, the problem areas that tend to um, 
that tend to arise. And again, I'm, Galeen is going to deal with a couple of cases in more detail on this. The, one of the areas that creates difficulty is the extent to which bids or contracting authority can contact a bidder and ask them to clarify anything uncertain in their bid. The bottom line is, and this is all set out in the Slavensko test, there is a discretion um, conferred on contracting authorities to seek clarifications, but they can't allow a bid to be rewritten. And the um, and any clarification, if it if it's if the clarification the reason for the clarification arises um, in a way that's applicable to all bids, then the clarification should be sent out to all bidders at the same time to avoid unequal treatment. Um, obviously, when conducting evaluation process, very important that the confidentiality of bids is maintained and any conflicts of interest are avoided and the, the, that's set out expressly in Regulation 21 and 24. Managing the audit trail and keeping reasons for score is of vital importance because otherwise you won't be able to, a contractual authority won't be able to comply with the duty of transparency. Um, a particular problem area is um, abnormally low bids and um, Regulation 69 um, addresses this point. It's not drafted very clearly and the courts um, looked at this in 2018 and looked at Regulation 69 and effectively said that that doesn't um, impose any absolute duty on contracting authorities to reject tenders on the basis of a, a low ball bid and a, a normally low bid, only a power um, and there's certainly no duty to investigate all bids. So that cleared up some of the uncertainty over what um, Regulation 69 um, uh, really meant and whether, it, and whether it just addressed investigation or general duty to, or, or a duty to reject. Another area um, which um, gives, uh, can, can cause problems is abandonment of, of, of a procurement. So having carried out the evaluation process, Contracting authority may think, hang on, um, although a bid has met all the criteria, we're not sure we really want to go ahead because for, for whatever reason. And the bottom line is that there's no absolute obligation to award a contract uh, following evaluation, and that's set out in a, a metal me mechanic uh, case. Um, clearly, there, there is some scope to um, around the edges of that, for example, if um, the, the, the decision to not award is in itself in breach of the principle of equal, unequal treatment. For example, whether a contract delivery might want to go back and its real agenda might be to award a similar contract down the line to a, the bidder that came second. But broadly, it's a very broad, broadly the principle is there's a very broad discretion to, on the contract authority to abandon a contract. So um, finally, at the end of the process, so we've had a counter three of the entire um, evaluation process, and we've got to the end now. How, um, how can a contract be lawfully awarded? Well, that, that can only be done through um, if the contract award notice has been issued to, um, uh, to um, disappointed bidders. The, I've set out the contents there on the, on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, one area that can create problems is the, the degree of detail that needs to go into when um, setting out the characteristics and relative advantages of a successful uh, tender. Um, you have to, certainly have to include the scores of the winning tender, um, but you also have to set out the uh, a sort of a re the relative characteristics and uh, the, sorry the characteristics and relative advantages of that tender. Um, don't have to go into too much detail at that stage to comply with Regulation 86. But clearly, if a bidder wants more detail, it's going to be entitled to it through um, both the duty of transparency, but also court rules concerning um, disclosure. Um, and we'll, we'll address that in a bit more detail um, next week. So once a valid contract award notice is issued, um, then the a standstill of 10 days has to be adhered to. Very important because a breach of that standstill used to be known as the Alcatel period after a case. Um, a breach of that standstill period gives rise to a to a ground gives rise to a ground for seeking a declaration of ineffectiveness. Um, now the standstill is extendable at the discretion of the contracting authority. And my final point would be um, if you are a bidder who 
is in discussions, a disappointed bidder in discussions with the contracting authority at the end of a um, procurement process, and the contracting authority has agreed to extend the standstill, do you still keep an eye on the 30 day limitation period uh, for bringing a challenge? Because that still applies even if the standstill keeps getting, getting extended. And it has been known for some contracting authorities, whether deliberately or otherwise, to run down the clock through, um, through just re repeating standstill period and then saying, um, thanks very much, you're now out of time. So I'm now um, going to hand you over to uh, Galina, who's going to talk about avoiding common pitfalls uh, during evaluation. Thank you, James. And um, just to introduce uh, Galena as the slides are handed over. Uh, Galena is um, uh, one of our uh, star specialists um, in, in this area. Uh, she's uh, uh, on the Attorney General's A panel. For those of you who don't know what that means, that means she's involved in top end government litigation. She works right across the public law spectrum and uh, she is uh, rightly rated in the uh, the relevant uh, uh, review publications as a star performer so uh, again sparing her blushes and there she is Galena Ward. Thank you Rob I just making sure I understand the technology can I move to the next slide yes um, or can I go back no sorry a uh, star performer but not with PowerPoint it, on zoom it turns out Okay, um, good morning everyone. Um, as Rob says, in the time that we've got left, I'm going to talk about how to avoid common pitfalls during evaluation, uh, or during the evaluation process that James was just talking about, um, also known as reasons why contracting authorities lose cases. Um, of course, the first way to avoid that is to properly understand the criteria you've put in the ITT. This is building on what James said about designing the process. So um, we think it's, well, I think it's always good to start with the picture. Um, this one is because the first case I want to talk about, MLS Overseas Limited and the Secretary of State for Defence, was a case in which an unsuccessful tenderer sought a declaration that the Ministry of Defence had acted unlawfully in its conduct of a competitive procurement process carried out in respect of a contract for a global port, maritime and other logistical support services for the Royal Navy. So there you are, that's a picture of a, a naval base. Um, it's an example of a case in which the contracting authority was found not to have been sufficiently clear in the ITT as to the basis on which the tender would be evaluated. Um, and you can see on the next slide, sorry. Um, it's a problem with two screens. You can see on the next slide, the evaluation methodology um, that was in the ITT. It was in three parts. So firstly, whether the bid was commercially compliant or non-compliant. Um, if it was compliant, um, then the technical evaluation made up 40% of the final score and the final evaluation made up 60, the financial evaluation made up 60%. Um, and the technical evaluation, so the 40% of the final score for the compliant bids, um, had six questions. They related to capability, customer relationship, supply chain management, value for money, safety and quality management. Um, and the scoring guidance for five of those questions set out the criteria that bidders needed to meet to get a score of either high confidence, good confidence, concerns or unacceptable. Um, and the response to each of those questions would be given one of those scores. Um, for the sixth question, or fifth in that list, safety, um, the guidance didn't set out any criteria for obtaining one of those scores. It just said what would be a pass and what would be a fail. Um, and then the rubric in relation to all six of them said that the contracting authority will reject any tender um, if any response receives an assessment of lower than good confidence. So that's fine. Everyone can understand what that means. Um, in relation to the five where good confidence was an available score. Um, but the question to raise in this case was what if you get a score of you're deemed to have failed on safety? Now, a layperson might think that fail is clearly lower than good confidence. And indeed, that was 
the Ministry of Defence's case that a reasonable tenderer would have understood that to fail on that question would mean automatic or alternatively discretionary rejection of the bid. Um, but the court, Mrs Justice O'Farrell disagreed. She noted there was no clear statement to that effect and that the competition could have stipulated that a pass would equate to good confidence, but it did not do so. Um, the relevant principle here um, is set out in the healthcare at home case on the slide by the Supreme Court and as was mentioned by James, is based on the concept of a reasonably well-informed and diligent tenderer, um, rewind as James said, um, and the award criteria must be formulated in such a way to allow all rewind tenderers to interpret them in the same way. So if there's any room for ambiguity, and so for example here, whether failing on safety would mean automatic or discretionary or even not be a ground for rejection, um, it can't then be relied on as a reason for rejecting the bid. The lesson here is that in order to comply with the principle of transparency, contracting authorities must expressly, which means leaving absolutely no room at all for ambiguity, set out both the consequences of any failure to pass any stipulated threshold and whether those consequences are mandatory or discretionary. So that's pitfall number one, treating a pass-fail criterion as a reason for rejection without clearly and explicitly specifying that that would be the case. Um, you can see, in fact, an example of where this pitfall was avoided um, in a case that was reported last week, um, Stagecoach and the Department of Transport, and the reference for that um, is 2020 EWHC 1568 in the TCC. The, um, the Department of Transport in that case had rejected bids to run a rail franchise on the basis that the bidder had refused to take on a pensions liability. Um, it's clearly stated in the competition documents that a bid could be refused on that basis, but one of the complaints was that there was no guidance as to when that discretion would be exercised. Um, but Stuart Smith, Mr Justice Stuart Smith, accepted that it was abundantly clear from the context that bids that were non-compliant for this reason would be rejected and the Department of Transport was entitled to do so in the circumstances. So the pitfall was avoided and I've just saved you reading a judgment that's nearly 200 pages long. Uh, moving on to the second pitfall, um, this is about not adhering strictly to the criteria that have been set um, and the leading case here, or certainly a leading case, is Energy Solutions EU Limited and the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. Um, this was a part of some fairly epic litigation, even by procurement standards. It went to the Supreme Court on issues about Frankovich damages. There were several first instance judgments on various issues. But for present purposes, the one you want, and I've given you the reference there, is the judgment of Mr Justice Fraser on liability. Um, it's even longer than the stagecoach judgment, 336 pages, um, but actually remarkably clear to follow and covers an awful lot of the material that we've attempted to summarise in these, this, this seminar and the one next week. Um, the litigation arose out of a competition to award a contract, which was described in the judgment as very sizable, a bit like the judgment itself, um, for decommissioning 12 different Magnox nuclear facilities. It was a massive contract and the competition was by necessity extremely complex. Um, it set out evaluation criteria, including thresholds that would result in disqualification if they weren't met. And the claimant was part of a consortium that came narrowly second in the competition um, and it claimed that the NDA had erred in the evaluation exercise both in some of the scores awarded um, and by wrongly not disqualifying the bidder that had scored narrowly higher than the claimant's consortium. Um, as I've said there's a lot of learning to be taken from that case and I'm sure that the speakers next week um, who are talking about bringing and defending challenges will come back to the issues around confidentiality around the importance or otherwise of evidence being given by witnesses called for the claimant, choice of witnesses for the defendant, and indeed their approach to giving ev evidence. Um, there's also some discussion of gender equality in the context of witnesses being entitled to win bonuses, um, but that ultimately didn't actually affect the result. For our purposes, the NDA's arguments effectively tried to introduce elements of flexibility into the criteria. So they included an argument that disqualification criteria should be construed generously or leniently in favour of the bidder. Um, this is in the context that there were only four bidders and the NDA didn't really want to disqualify any of them, but the strict application of the criteria would have that result um, and it was held that they were not permitted to 
lean against disqualification, as they put it. Um, it was also argued that there was a margin of appreciation within which the court should be reluctant to interfere, even if it had found a manifest error in the application of the criteria. Um, and it was also argued that proportionality could be relied upon to interpret the ITT or the scoring matrix. All of those arguments were rejected um, and the judge held that it was specifically that it was not disproportionate for any failure to meet, to meet a, a particular criterion to have the consequences that have been specified in relation to that criterion. So the learning here is that it's absolutely critical that once the rules are clearly set out in the competition documents, they are strictly applied at the evaluation stage. And again, this goes back to some extent to James's presentation. It's about the importance of making sure you have the rules you want in your competition documents because the court is not going to do that for you. Um, finally, um, and arising out of the principle of transparency, um, another common pitfall is not to sufficiently clearly record the reasoning during the evaluation process. Um, again, this is covered as quite a lot about this in the NDA case, um, and I've set out some passages on the slide. Um, it's a bit like when public authorities avoid making records that might be subject to freedom of information requests. Um, in this case, there'd been a conscious decision that was found not to record some stages of the process, apparently with a view to avoiding any challenges to the reasoning. Um, Mr Justice Fraser was not impressed by that, um, as he said, important aspects of the evaluation process were wholly lacking in transparency. Um, decisions about what, about what to, about scoring that could lead to a bidder being disqualified were made off stage and consciously so in my judgment. Um, and the whole approach of the NDA to restricting notes in this way seems to have been designed to minimise the degree of scrutiny to which the SMEs, those were the people doing the evaluating, to which their thought processes could be subject. Um, and it would have been perfectly possible, as he said, to, um, to keep proper records. Um, he was also not impressed by the reliance in that case on privilege, on legal professional privilege, in relation to a legal review that had been carried out, which led to some changes in the scores that had initially been awarded. Um, he didn't require privilege to be waived, but, or didn't find that privilege had been waived, um, but he pointed out that a challenge would not be readily defensible um, if reasons weren't going to be provided for the scores for that reason. Um, and this leads into a, a wider point about the importance of recording reasons. Um, so even if the court isn't able to say that the claimant would have or would have had a chance of being awarded the contract if the evaluation had been done properly, the decision to award to another bidder can simply be quashed if the reasons given are inadequate. Um, as a good example, albeit not actually under the um, public contracts regulations, but applying the same principles, um, in a case called Lancashire Care NHS Foundation and Lancashire County Council. And the important point that's made in that case is that simply listing positive and negative features is not the same as providing reasoning about the weight that's been given to each criterion in reach or each element in reaching a conclusion. So the court and the unsuccessful bidder needs to be able to understand why a particular score has been awarded um, in order to comply with the, the principle of transparency. So, in summary, the pitfalls I've discussed can be avoided by firstly making sure that the evaluators properly understand the requirements of the bid documents, secondly sticking absolutely rigidly to those requirements, um, and thirdly transparently documenting the reasons for the decisions that are reached during the evaluation process. Um, we'll now, we've got five minutes left I think, um, take some questions. Thank you, Galena crystal clear and uh, saving people reading uh, 100 and whatever it was, 90 pages um, uh, worth its weight in gold. So so thank you for that. Um, we, we're coming towards the end. Um, we've got um, time for some questions. Um, there is a, a question here which we will uh, answer and it's a, it uh, conjures up uh, a nice image of what might be going on. Here's the question. What kind of evidence is required if a company is to be excluded on the basis of previous poor performance. That is that if we want to exclude the current service provider from a future tender due to their current poor performance. Uh, no names, no pack drill obviously, but uh, James, uh, over to you for that one. Yes, so um, that's a, it's a good question and um, I think it relates to 
Regulation uh, 57 um, 8, because that sets out um, as a discretionary um, exclusion, and I'm just, um, I, I've got the regulation in front of me, I'm just going to read out for it, where, where the economic operator has shown significant or persistent deficiencies in the performance of a substantive requirement under a prior public contract, and here's the important bit, uh, which led to early term, termination of that prior contract, damages or other comparable um, situations, uh, sorry, or other comparable sanctions. So um, in terms of the kind of evidence that's required, I think it's more a question of um, asking bidders to disclose if um, they have um, uh, been involved in a, or been awarded a contract, which has actually led to an early termination of that or um, some sort of damages award um, for breaching of, uh, for, for, for breaches of that contract. Seems to me that I don't think there's anything um, specified in Regulation 60, which talks about means of proof um, that um, addresses this particular point. I think that Regulation 60 talks about uh, proving, it sets out um, how uh, an economic operator's economic and financial standing can be proved and there's various lists there in terms of financial statements or, or, or bank statements, statements of actual turnover. But I don't think it, I don't think there's anything there that addresses this question of whether there's any particular type of evidence that's required to, um, uh, to, 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 to show um, whether or not they have performed a contract uh, sufficiently. So you've really got to go back to uh, uh, the, the evidence that you can ask for is really just a question or confirmation of that bid as to whether or not it's, um, it's, it's done something that's led to early termination or a damages award. Um, I hope that um, that helps. Um, Thank you, James, for that. Um, you, if, if you can do it in, in 30 seconds, James. Uh, uh, we've got one uh, question come in, I think reference to a, to a point you made, the 10 day extendable standstill period. Um, uh, so after the decision made, there's a 10 day, 10 day extendable standstill period. What does that mean? Yeah, so um, the, the, the standstill period um, is a period, and I should have um, made this clearer when I did the presentation, this is a good point. Standstill period is a period during which the contract, although it's been awarded in inverted commas, so although the decision to award it has been announced to the, the winning bidder and the disappointed bidder, it hasn't actually been signed, it hasn't been entered into. And the standstill period is simply the period during which the contract cannot be entered into. Um, that's what the, the standstill relates to. The, um, after the end of the, that 10 day period, then the contract can be signed on the dotted line. When I talk about extendable, I mean, what I mean is that a, an authority can say um, in response to a disappointed bidder, um, although I don't accept your, your complaint, we're going to give you further time to um, consider the material we're sending you and we won't enter into the contract, we won't sign it until say two weeks time or, or another 10, 15 days. Now, the reason that's important is that and we're going to really cover this next week, is that the remedies available to a disappointed bidder change pretty drastically once a contract is actually signed on the dotted line. So by, not, by, by voluntarily saying, I'm not going to, as a contra contract authority, I'm not going to um, enter the contract, it keeps options, keeps all the options on the table for that agreed bidder. Um, and that's why it's, that's why it's, um, it's, it, it's, that's what I meant by extendable standstill period. Thanks, James. And um, look, that brings us to the end of our time. I can see uh, other questions coming in. Uh, implications of leaving the EU, absolutely, um, uh, across the board. Um, uh, a, a, a crucial question. But look, we're out of time, so all it, all it does uh, remains for me to do is to, to thank uh, our speakers, uh, James and Galena, uh, to thank uh, Anna Martins, who's behind the scene dealing with the IT uh, to uh, wish you all uh, uh, well and hopefully see as many of you as possible uh, next week uh, in, in part two of the um, uh, procurement. So that's it from us. Uh, thanks very much indeed. <laughs>